Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Awesome. Well, listen, uh, tonight I have uh, one of our leaders here. Uh, Steve De La Rosa, is, uh, he's our prayer team ministry leader. They're also our, our team leads for uh, the ministry that we have called Reveal. And Reveal is a night that we basically put all the emphasis on um, internal healing. We go a little bit deeper with with one-on-ones with people and, and helping them um, overcome maybe some trauma or things that have taken place in their life that were so impactful that have hindered people for years from ever really discovering everything that God's called them to be and and do. And so tonight I asked Steve, I said, uh, we had some dinner last night, and we are just talking about the future of Elevate Church and, and what our goals are and what we plan to do with Reveal and um, where we want to take it in 2019. And uh, as he was speaking with me, I said, you know what, uh, why don't you just share with me tonight because um, what I want to talk to you about tonight is, everybody say conversion. conversion. You know, some of us still haven't had a full conversion yet, but that's okay. You know, that's not to hate on anybody. Listen, there are Christians that have been saved for 20 years, and they still haven't converted yet. And so tonight we're going to get a, 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 a deeper revelation of that because I don't think you, you would be here tonight if you weren't hungry to have a full conversion, right? I mean, how many know that we should go from glory to glory? It, it shouldn't just stop at information, and, and I had a little transformation, and yay, hallelujah, let's go to home to be with the Lord now. No, God, God has something special and unique for you to do on this earth. And as long as you are breathing and you're alive, your work is not done yet. So are you guys ready? So without further ado, help me welcome Mr. Steve De La Rosa. All right, man. How's everyone? You guys are the diehards, man. I'm telling you guys, you guys are the, the example for the church right now right? It's raining. It's not pouring yet, but it is raining, right? I heard somebody say once that we Christians sometimes are made out of paper because when it rains, we start to dissolve. So we, we're, we're scared to go out. You know what I'm saying? But tonight, I know that God has a word for you guys in season. I want you guys to write something down. I want you guys to write this. We don't have to fear what we don't understand. We don't have to fear what we don't understand. Eight years ago, I walked in through those doors with my beautiful wife, Jessica, who's sitting right there. We walked in eight years ago. But when we walked in, how many of you guys have seen us walked in? You've seen my wife. She's smiling all the time. She's happy. She's jittery. I'm not like that, right? I'm still working on that. But eight years ago, I walked in through those doors, and I was broken, busted, and disgusted. So if you were here eight years ago, I'm sorry if I treated you bad. I was at a place where I hated people. So if you were people, I hated you. Um, I hated I, I literally hated my life. I hated my marriage. I hated everything that was around me. Um, and I even hated the church. Um, I had this anger towards the church. I never hated God because I always feared God. I always had a fear and a respect for God and for Jesus. So I never hated them personally, but I hated the church. And I remember coming to church every Sunday when we started to come. The only reason I came was because I didn't want to fight with my wife. That was the only reason I came, right? Because she was coming here and she was getting restored, transformed, and I wasn't. I was getting angrier and angrier, you know, because here she is crying while she's worshiping, and I'm over here like, I just want to go home, but I don't want to fight. And if I stay home, she's going to come home and fight, you know? So this was a sense of peace for me, you know? This was the place where we can be normal. People saw us and was like, wow, you have a whole bunch of kids. You guys must love each other, you know? <laughs> And while we were coming here, not only were we in a bad place where we hit rock bottom, but on top of that, my wife was pregnant with our, like, what is it, sixth child, seventh child, right? She was pregnant. So not only was I angry because of that, I was also angry because she was pregnant, but it was my fault, right? So that's where we were at. That's where we were at eight years ago. And I'll never forget, you know, there was this one time, and this is where I was sharing with Pastor last night. How many of you guys know when you share something with Pastor, he's going to... He's going to stretch you, right? He's going to stretch you. So I was sharing with Pastor last night. You know, he's talking about how sometimes we can be saved for so long, but never be fully in, never have a full encounter. And that's who I was. 
I was saved for over 10 years. I got saved when I was 18 years old. I didn't understand what that really was. All I knew is that I had a passion for God, and I loved Jesus. But the one person I didn't know and I never knew about was the Holy Spirit. I heard of the Holy Spirit. I've read of the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know the Holy Spirit. I've never encountered the Holy Spirit. And I remember one day being in the service, and someone asked me, I was eight, eight, almost 19, and they said, do you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? And I was like, yeah, what is that? And then they started to describe it, and I said, oh, man, I don't know if I want that, because only the women in the church are baptized with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, and like, for me, the Holy Spirit was weak, right? It was a weak thing to be, to be a, bunch of, uh, a man around a whole bunch of women praying and crying and, and being moved. I was like, I, I don't know if I want that. And they're like, no, this is what you need. So in my mind, guess what? I thought that was just another thing I had to check off in my Christian walk. I said, okay, so I love God. I have Jesus in my heart. So now I just got to check off the Holy Spirit, right? So I get baptized. I thought I got baptized with the Holy Spirit, right? And I was good with that. I was like, oh, I, when people ask me, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? I would say, yeah, but I don't operate in it, you know, because it was, that wasn't me. You know, I was one of those men, you know what I'm saying? 18, 19 years old, I used to have my hair shaved. I had just finished competing for the Teen Muscle Man Championship. So, you know, I was like, no, man, I don't need that. I don't need, I, I don't want the Holy Spirit. I feared something I didn't understand. That's what my fear was. That's how I was brought up, you know, to fear things that you don't understand. So I never truly had a relationship with the Holy Spirit. But here's the crazy thing. Just like Pastor said, your miracles, your healings, everything that God does looks different every single time, right? So I won't forget, it was August 2010. My wife was pregnant. She was sitting at home, and I was out at the bar with the boys, drinking and partying. Um, if you knew me back then, I was very quiet. I didn't like to talk to people. But if you got a couple of drinks in me, I was the life of the party. Now it's different. I don't have to drink. I'm the life of the party. That's just how it is, right? That's just how it is. So, you know, that's, that's just how it is now. But I'll never forget, I'm drinking. I'm with my buddies. I'm drunk out of my mind. And we're all just partying. And I heard this voice in the back of my ear. It wasn't a condemning voice. It wasn't a voice that was like, it was just this voice of, Steve, what are you doing here? And it was like, your wife's at home. She's about to give birth to your child. And what is it that you're doing here? Why are you here? And I was like, man, this is some really good stuff right now. <laughs> like, this, I'm hearing these voices. So I start to have this com conversation within myself. I'm like, because I just want to hang out with the boys, and I'm just partying. And I clearly hear him say, no, tell me exactly why you're here. And I remember saying, I'm here because I hate who I am. I hate my life. I hate my wife. That's a rhyme. I hate my life. I hate my wife. I hate the situation that we're in. We have hit rock bottom, and there's no way up. I can't get back up. I can't. There's no way I can get back up. So I'm here because I just want to mask it all. That's why I'm here. And he said... I clearly heard him say, because see, I've, I've heard the voice of Jesus before that. This voice was different. This voice was a lot different. And then he said, I need you just to get up and just go home and restore your relationship with your wife. And I said, there's no way I can go home because I'm really drunk right now. <laughs> right? I, I am, I'm out of it. I've driven before super drunk, and it's not, it's not healthy. Right? It's not good. I said, if you really want me to go home right now, then make me sober. To sober me up. And I remember immediately I got, I opened my eyes and it was so loud. It smelled in there. It was like all these emotions started to happen. I was like, what am I doing here? And one of my best friends, one of my buddies was like, what's wrong, dude? And I was like, I I'm not drunk anymore, dude. Like, what happened? And he's like, ah, look, Steve's not drunk anymore. Let's, let's hook him up. And they lined up maybe like, you know, four or five tequila shots, you know, in a row. And they're like, oh, man, just go. And I, I took them. You know, that's, that's who I was. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, man. I, I took them. I, I, you know. But I remember when I took my last one, I still remember to this day, it, like, it didn't burn. Nothing happened. And I was like, dude. And I started arguing with the bartender, like, why would you give me water? Like, 
and we we're going back and forth. And he's like, you just don't want to pay the tab. And I was like, I'm not even paying for it. They're paying for it. And we start arguing. And my buddy's like, dude, what's wrong with you? And I was like, bro, the Holy Spirit just talked to me, I think, right now. <laughs> and he's looking at me like, what? And I was like, the Holy Spirit said, I need to get up, go home, and apologize to my wife. And he's like, dude, I think you're still drunk. And I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> I was like, I'm not. And I'll never forget, I, got, I was like, I got to go. I got to go. I left. I got in my car, started driving home. I'm like, all right, God, I'm really, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I, I, she opens the door. I say, hey, this is what happened. I was out. I was partying. I was drunk. I'm not drunk anymore. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for everything that I've done. I'm sorry for being out. I said, and then the Holy Spirit said, say you love your wife right now. And I said, I love you. I hadn't said I love you to my wife in over a year at that time because that's where we were. We were in that place. As I, once I experienced that, I wanted to know more of who the Holy Spirit was. I had this encounter of like, whoa. See, he's going to talk about Paul when Saul had this encounter, right? He had that encounter. But just imagine if he would have had that encounter with Jesus and he would have just walked away saved, where would we be at right now? What would have happened back then? No, but he had an encounter, and he wanted more. He wanted more, and that's what I wanted. And we're going to put on my first scripture, which is Acts 1.8. Everybody knows this scripture, right? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. See, I always thought that the Holy Spirit was what? weak. I didn't want that. But once I started to read the book of Acts and I started to learn about the Holy Spirit, I was like, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit isn't weak. There's power in the Holy Spirit. I want to know more. And I was hungry. I was hungry. I was able to now start going out and guess what I started to do? I started to talk about God again. I started to do, talk about what Jesus did in my life. But this time I did it with power. This time I did it with this, this power of, of I know who my Jesus is. I know who this Holy Spirit is. This is the same Holy Spirit that took me out of that place and brought me here today. Amen? And I want you guys to read the second verse, which is Acts 4.31. And it says, when, I'm, I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was like, question? No, I'm just saying. <laughs> Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. This boldness. We got home. I'm not lying. It was a Friday night when that happened. Sunday morning, I was first one up, ready to go to church. I was like, we got to go, girl. And she was like, who is this man? You know? If there wasn't a fourth baby, there was probably not just playing, but, you know, that's how it was. That's how it was back then, you know? But... That's what started to happen. And guess what? That boldness that I'm talking about was to the people around me. Because I had a whole bunch of friends who knew my situation. And I remember them saying, why are you trying to work it out with your wife? You just leave her. Just leave. You're such a loser. Like, what's going on? But I stopped for a minute. And I, I remember this verse because the book of Acts is my favorite book of the whole Bible. Because it, it, there's transformation with the Holy Spirit. And I remember saying, no. That's not true. You know who my wife is? She is this. She is that. You know my marriage? Yet it, it, it may have been broken, but now it's fixed. Now it's restored. See, I bind what you speak right now. You know, that's who I was. I was like, I'm, I, there was this boldness like, dude, shut your mouth, you know? <laughs> Cast you down, you know? No, but that was amazing. Sometimes we think that the encounter of the, with the Holy Spirit has to look a certain way, has to feel a certain way. We, we, we go based off man's opinion on how it looks. But it's not how, based on man. See, I was reading this scripture, and I love it. Because I've read it a lot, but I finally understood it. Because it was personal to me. It was mine. I owned it. It was Acts 2, 2 to 4. Suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. And the roar of the wind was so overpowering it was all anyone could bear. Then all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. 
It's separated into tongues of fire that engulf each one of them. I was in a bar, and that's where the Holy Spirit met me. See, I always pictured the Holy Spirit like coming with a little feather and saying, you're baptized. You know what I'm saying? That's how I pictured it. But that's not, that's not what happened with me. The Holy Spirit kicked down the bar door and said, where's Steve at? Where's this guy at? Because I'm here. And when I was talking to my friend, another translation talks about tongues of fire on top of their head. That's probably what my friend saw. He was probably like freaked out of what he was seeing. He's like, dude, this is some good stuff probably, right? But to this day, my friend still talks about that experience. Till this day, he says, dude, I started to go to Bible studies because of that. Till this day. So, guys, this is for the guys. This is for the guys. Because sometimes we want the women to be the forerunners of the church. Sometimes we want the women to say, well, I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit, but my wife is. So I'm good. No, 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 no. We have to be the ones to take ownership. We have to be the ones that are seeking that are asking and that are saying, Holy Spirit, come and fill me so that I can have this boldness to lead my family forward. So that I can have this boldness that when this next situation comes and I don't know what, how to get out of it, I can depend on you, Holy Spirit. I can depend on you to be my helper. I'm the one that's going to get me out of this. The one that's going to show me how to get out of this. So today, that's my challenge to you. Maybe 2018 hasn't been your year, but it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Today I challenge you. Ask the Holy Spirit how to get out of your situation tonight. So that way when you leave 2018 into 2019, you already go in there with victory. Amen? All right. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Great job, Steve. Awesome, awesome job. I want you to go to Acts chapter 9 and just park there. Open your Bibles, Acts chapter 9. Um, don't put up the scriptures yet, guys. But if you have a Bible, open it. If you use technology, use it. I have to say that, that if, if, if we were to understand as the church, as the body of Christ in general, that goes for every Christian, every believer, why some get it and why others don't, why some are completely ignited and why others are not as ignited when it comes to the things of God it's very simple um, we asked on Sunday if you were here uh, at our service when we started the new series called it's Jesus we went out and we interviewed people and we asked do you think that Jesus still has influence in the culture we live in today and one guy said um, well the truth is is that the only influence Jesus has is the one that people give him permission to have. So in other words, we limit what God can do in your life and in my life. So many times we're, we're, we're pointing the finger on everyone else of the why we haven't grown or developed in our relationship or even walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has always been like, of course, like I'm sure many of you like, you know, that's my savior. I mean, there's no one other like Jesus, no, no one other. But if I were to look at the different disciples in the Bible, I think every one of us can relate to someone uh, that served God in a passionate way, whether it's a, a female disciple or a male disciple. For, my, for me, it was the Apostle Paul. Like, I totally related with the Apostle Paul because I can understand that before the Apostle Paul became Paul, he was Saul. Just like before you came to Christ, you were something else. Stephen was something else before he finally really came to this revelation of his intimacy with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And then, and, and if you don't remember Steve, oh my God, help us, Jesus. Man, he was mean. No, he was really mean. How many members, how many, how many were with us when we started eight years ago? Anybody remember Steve? I'd be like this, like, hey, Steve. Okay, see you later, Steve. Like, that's what it was like, man. It was like, like, wow. Like, Lord, please send him to another church, please. <laughs> Just kidding. But never underestimate what the Holy Spirit can do with someone's life. See? It's, it's when the Holy Spirit... It's when the Holy Spirit arrests your life. It's when you allow the Holy Spirit to take your life and do something with it that you begin to see a full conversion. 
And uh, in the book of Acts chapter 9, we see the conversion of Paul. And it wasn't just any conversion. I get it. I don't think there's ever been or there will ever be another Apostle Paul, honestly, because the things he suffered um, was tremendous. But if you think about the Apostle Paul, Paul's life was so transformed and changed that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to author 13 books of the New Testament. To be the author, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write 13 books of this New Testament that you and I get to read in church or at home or to your family or your kids. And, and this transformation was so powerful to him that he had the humility to say um, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, I believe. You can just write that down. I didn't give that to media. He said, imitate me as I imitate who? And so I have to say that as you read the, the, the life of the disciples, we actually have a perfect example of what we could follow, right? Because I know that as Christians, we can get all bent out of shape because you got hurt because of a Christian that may have hurt your feelings or may have disappointed you, and then you just get stuck with that person. Well, how about open your Bible, look at the disciples, and look at all the disappointments they experienced, all the setbacks they had to go through, and yet they endured all for the purpose of, of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul said, hey, listen, uh, forget everybody else you know, but imitate me as I imitate who? Christ. And so Paul had his example. Jesus was his example. Then he had the boldness and the courage to say, and you guys, you can follow my example, and we're going to do some crazy, amazing stuff. So I love the fact that he, he has this, this story in the Bible of his conversion. And, and think about it. In Acts chapter 9, that was not the first time that, that he meets uh, or has this experience of this conversion. But after that conversion with Jesus, in like three other chapters within the book of Acts, he goes and he shares his conversion to people that wanted to kill him. But let's not get it twisted. Let's understand that Paul or Saul had a history. He had a background. He... He wasn't the greatest person. Now, obviously, we know that he was like the modern-day terrorist. He was always, you know, finding ways to get letters from the high priests uh, to give him the permission to go into places like Damascus, which is where Acts chapter 9 takes place. And he's going to Damascus for the purpose of slaughtering more Christians. If you read in Acts chapter 6, you see the story where, where the, the church was multiplying. People were coming to Christ. People were becoming Christians. And, and, and the disciples came and they spoke to each other. And they said, you know what? We can't keep neglecting the preaching of the gospel in order for us just to attend tables because it just got so big. So they said, let us seek amongst us a man full of faith, full of power, and full of the Holy Ghost that could tend to the crowds. And they selected a man by the name of Stephen. And Stephen was a passionate man, full of faith, full of power, and full of the Holy Spirit. But the preach got on him. The anointing got on him. The evangelism got on him. And we know that he starts leading all these people that were entrusted to him because of his full conversion. And man, this guy is like multiplying the church even more. So obviously he had great leadership. But what happens when, when, when they found out what Stephen was doing, they came to arrest him, but they came to stone him to death. And there was something about Stephen that he wasn't afraid. There's something about when you finally come to that realization that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, nothing really moves you. And we can all come to that place. That's the exciting thing. We can all come to that place that no matter what, no matter what accusation, no matter what setback, no matter what disease, no matter what person, no matter what people, you would have the boldness of the Holy Spirit to face it and say, Jesus has me. And he did because when they came to stone him, he looked up to his helper and he wasn't afraid. And the person who gave the green light on that moment in Acts chapter 6 for Stephen to be martyred was the apostle Paul who was Saul then. So Saul was looking. All the guys had their rocks. Everybody was ready, right? And then Saul went like this. And they went and they stoned him to death. 
a martyr. It's incredible when you read that. So just think about it. This, is, this would be a modern day ISIS man. A hater of God, yet he did it in the name of religion. He did this for God, supposedly. Kind of like Hitler, you know, wiped out millions and millions of, of Jewish people all in the name of God. It was twisted. It was wrong, right? But now we have this, this, this crazy conversion. And the reason I'm talking to you about this because I wanted to speak to us about our conversion. Like, how is your conversion? Is it, is it, is it powerful? Is it limited? Is it religious? Um, is, it, is it moving lives forward? Is it, is it a spiritual roller coaster? Um, are you halfway in, halfway out? Uh, are, you, are you walking in faith? Or are you hardly walking? Like, where are you at today? Because when you look at, uh, at Saul, let me give you some history from Saul to Paul. You guys got my points? Media? Please tell me you got them. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead. Number one. From Saul to Paul, he went, look, it was by birth, he was a Jew. By conviction, he was a Pharisee. By citizenship, he was a Roman. By education, a Greek. And by the grace of God, he became a Christian. Now check this out. But then Paul was transformed and he became a missionary, a theologian, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, a preacher, an organizer, a leader, a thinker. Come on, we need some more thinkers in the church. Praise Jesus. Help us, Lord. We do. We need more thinkers in the church. Help us. A thinker, a statesman. Come on, when he would be brought before arenas. Man, that was like him walking into the government, and he would speak up for the name of Jesus. And he would tell his story. So he was a statesman, a fighter, and he was a lover. In the midst of all the stuff he went through and did, he was all these things all at the same exact time. What a conversion, huh? To be able to be all these things, to be like some of us, we just think that our Christianity is just this little helmet of salvation, and we look cute right it's like the new fad of our helmet and and for paul paul's like no i'm 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 writing inspired by the holy spirit my testimony my story because there's not one person on this earth that has a background so bad that god can do something so amazing with it and use it for something better use it for something good i think we leave the evangelism to the church no guess what you can be an evangelist you can be a teacher. You can be a theologian. Well, I can't go to school. Just open your Bible. There's your school. Like we start digging into the scriptures and really start getting a depth of understanding. You don't have to, listen, a theologian is just a title. God wants you to dive deep into the word of God and let the word of God be your greatest teacher. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is your teacher. And he says, and he will teach you all things, not some things, not a few things. He said, I'll teach you all things. The problem is, is that we have too many students not showing up that are cutting class. And we're just letting the pastor spoon feed us. And so Paul is, is writing this. So when we read our Bible, when you read the book of Acts, it's not just for us to say like, wow, wasn't that wonderful? Look at history. Isn't that just so great? No, Paul's saying, hey, listen, imitate me. Follow the example. And once again, we're not all going to be Pauls. They'll, none of us, will, I'm not going to be a Paul. But guess what? But we can be something close to a Paul. And we can change some lives. And we can do some crazy, amazing stuff for God. And so um, when you think about uh, Paul, once again, he's, 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 he's vicious, man. He's, he's, he's very well versed. Do you realize that the apostle Paul, he memorized, memorized the entire Old Testament Bible, he memorized it word for word. He was much more advanced 
even of those who were his rulers or his leaders. He knew more than his own leaders. So just think about all of the influence this man had. So when he was able to, to understand the, 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 the Judaism and the law, man, he can break it down like nobody's business. So the moment he opened his mouth, everybody just wanted to listen and do whatever he wanted. Imagine if we just, if we just knew just a little bit more word, I think more people like his friend would want to know a little bit more about our God. But because we lack, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. We're destroyed. It's more of a culture than a kingdom. The church is more of a culture than a kingdom. And the church will never become kingdom until we get a, until we get a culture of his kingdom in us. That's why, that's why when the disciples asked, teach us how to pray, he said, this is how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Whose kingdom? His kingdom. He's like, God, get some kingdom inside of me. And, and when kingdom comes inside of us, I'm telling you, we, we won't be the typical Christian. There's going to be a, converse, a full conversion of a believer that completely walks in this power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is just saying, will someone just tag me in? Come on, tag me in. Tag me in. Let me in. Let me go. Let me, let me feel you. Let me, let me lead you. Let me guide you. Let me direct you. Let's do some crazy, amazing stuff. Holy Spirit is just waiting on us. We complicate it, don't we? So let's look at Acts 9. You there? I'm just going to read to you the way I read my Bible. Is that okay? So let's just take, I, I was reading this uh, yesterday, I think. Yeah, yesterday, because then I met with Steve. So I was reading this yesterday morning. And uh, let's start with verse 1 and 2 of Acts chapter 9. It says, then Saul, Saul so here's, here's the before, the B.C., before Christ. Then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He was what? Breathing threats. Everybody say, breathing threats. So notice, listen, when you take the word breathing, breathing is an inhale, not exhale. So just think, just breathing threats. He just, ah, he, in other words, when you, when you take the word breathe from, from, from the original, right, from the Greek, it simply means what? Living. So he was living these threats, and he was living murders. It's what he lived. And so he says, then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and he asked letters from them or from him to the synagogues of Damascus of that if he found any who were of the... Anyone. That means that, man, you didn't have to be all sold out, but if you even claim to know Jesus, you're the way. And so he said, I, he said, I need some letters because if I find any man or woman that are of that way. But of course, today in our society, way, the way for the church looks different now today than, than it did then, right? And so in these times, the way was people, once they came to Christ, they were all in. They would literally give their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They knew persecution. And he says... Um, whether men or women, he might bring them down to Jerusalem. So he was a fire-breathing Pharisee that was murdering Christians. We see that. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 3 through 9. It says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Come on, that was a Stephen moment. You know what? I love the road of Damascus because we can see the road of Damascus like this. Like God, God wants to damask us from all of our crud. He wants to take the mask off of us. And so he's on this road of Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and here he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting what? Me. Notice he didn't say, why are you persecuting my followers of, of Jesus? Why are, you, why are you messing with my peeps? No. Listen, when they persecute you, they persecute him. So God forbid the person that's persecuting you. Lord, help them. Think about it. So instead of defending yourself, just think this way. God's going God's to go ahead and have my back on this one. And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus 
whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed, doesn't that sound like the story? Like, I mean, okay, Stephen, fine, take your last shots, but go home and tell your wife you're sorry. And I really believe that the Holy Spirit has spoken to everyone here. The question is, is how many have obeyed him? Like you're wondering, well, why? I want what he has. God's saying, hey, son, daughter, just do the last thing I told you and we can start. Like, What was the last assignment? What was the last mission? What was the last thing that, that, that the Lord asked you to do that you have yet to do it? Because Paul, man, had one moment. He got kicked off his high horse. And then all of a sudden he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And look what the Lord says to him. And the men who uh, were, uh, all right, he said, arise, go to the city, into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground. I just keep seeing the bar, man. I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, ever say, and when his eyes were opened. Do you know that that's what God wants that's what God wants us to experience is when we read the word. And, and you know what? Right now, your eyes have been all open. But how many know that God wants to open our eyes to a fresh revelation? God wants to open, open our eyes uh, to a new dimension of knowing him, a, a, a new understanding of who he is personally, intimately. Like God wants to inject it. Like if you've just been walking around in a daze, if you've just kind of been making excuses for your lack of willingness to be committed to following Christ, like God wants to open our eyes. But notice, this is the first time that Paul meets Jesus. Paul never met Jesus prior to this. But it's, it's, it's interesting because we know that in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. So think about it. You want to meet Jesus? Get in your word. You will never meet the real Jesus until you set your eyes in the word. He's on his little donkey. Jesus shows up like this big light. Boom, he gets knocked down and bam, his eyes are open. It's pretty amazing. Isn't that cool just reading the Bible like that? Are y'all bored yet? Better not. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand, and they brought him into Damascus. Now watch this. And he was there for three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So his eyes were open, but they weren't open. In other words, his eyes were wide open, but he was blind. He couldn't see anything, and neither ate nor drank. And so this is, this is talking about his encounter with Jesus. Do you still remember your encounter with Jesus? Does it still mean anything to you, like how you came to Christ? Like if, if you want to return back to your first love, you have to get back to that first time that you and God were on the road of Damascus and he unveiled himself to you. Verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Now check this out. So God gives him direction. It's interesting how God could have just took care of everything. Jesus could have been like, man, I'm just going to rock your world right here, right now, and go. And he doesn't. You know why? Jesus is a team player. Jesus wants someone that's not like a Paul to also be a part of the equation or be a part of the fruitfulness that's about to take place. Do you realize that this right here that we're reading in Acts chapter 9 is historical? Like, do you realize in Acts chapter 9, it was the beginning of the movement of the body of Christ. The church was birthed through Apostle Paul. Like, this is where it all started. That's why he's the apostle. He's the evangelist. He's the teacher. He's the prophet. He's the pastor. Man, he's the mission. He's the apostle. He knows how to function in every part of the ministry. And because of this conversion, because of this full conversion, you and I get to experience Elevate Church or any 
church for that matter on the globe every single weekend because of one man who made a decision to obey the voice of Jesus when he said, go into the city. There's a man that you're going to meet, and his name is Ananias. Now, you may not be Paul, but maybe you're Ananias. And God is looking for some Ananias in this culture, in this uh, 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 society, in this moment of our life. He needs some an Ananias. So aren't you glad that God is looking for people? He could have just, how many believe that Jesus could have just handled it all right there by himself? Listen, that's why it's the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, because they are team players. That's why when we say serve, volunteer, get connected, it's not because we just need more people to say we got people. It's because it's a lot of work to advance the kingdom of God. God's kingdom, God's gospel, God's word will never expand unless we are team Jesus. Never. And so there's a guy named Ananias, just, just some regular, you know, dude. Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision. So look, he speaks, he speaks now to Ananias in a vision. And he says, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. Wouldn't that be awesome if the Lord can just speak to people at Elevate Church and just call your name? You're just like, yes, Lord. But do you know that, that God, it's not that God, it's not that God lacks voice. It's that we lack to hear his voice. God's not lacking assignments. God's not lacking mission. God's lacking obedience. Not him. Us. Just looking for someone that's got some orejas. Spiritual ears. You can say orejas. Yeah, he's just, he's just seeing who has spiritual ears to hear. And Ananias, he said, hey, Ananias. He's like, yo, what's up, Lord? Here I am. What do you need? And look. He says, arise and go to the street called Straight. Because we're about to straighten someone out. <laughs> and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul. So obviously, <laughs> now he's got another guy. So he's, he, Paul's now being sent to Judas' house. Judas has probably also heard from God, hey, I'm bringing Paul. Uh, you know, put, it, put him up on your A, A R and B, whatever, and, and let him stay at your pad. For behold, he is what? Praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Think about it. Jesus could have just not opened his eyes only, but literally opened his eyes. But no, he said, man, I have, I have infused my body with my Holy Spirit, and I can't tell my people that I gave him the Holy Spirit, and then I go ahead and do it for them. How can I say I'm going to give you the helper and then I'm still doing the work for you? How am I going to keep, you know, doing all the work? And I believe that, you know what? It's so hard to reach Muslim people, especially people of ISIS. But I have met a few Muslims in my life who, who said that the way they came to Christ was not by a Christian, but Jesus walking into their room in the middle of the night. Amen. And I'm just like, wow, really? Like, like he walked into your room? And, and they're like, walked into my room. Many of them said, I never saw his face, but I knew it was the Lord. And see, I get it because it's not that, it's not that, that, that God doesn't have power for us to reach Muslims or ISIS or people that are like Saul's, right, that are terrorists. It's that there's, there's not enough power in the body of Christ or people that will take God at his word and would say, God, inf infuse me with your Holy Spirit and wherever you send me, I will go. So God lacks people. That's why he says, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so you know what he says to Elevate Church and to every church in Santa Clarita? Pray to the Lord of the harvest that people would wake up and go into a full conversion and really be the witnesses that I'm calling them to be. Like for real. Let's be honest. Christianity for us is going to church, singing songs. Can we, can we be honest? That's what the church has been made up of now. What's the pastor's far? Praise God, it's his. It's his. No, no, stop. Stop. I think more pastors will be encouraged when the body's walking in the power. 
pastor like, what? You did what? You laid hands on how many people in the hospital? Come here. Come testify, man. Man, and then you start testifying. Yeah, I was in the hospital. And then there's revival. Jesus shared He shared the glory. Why can't we all share it? Jesus said, hey, I'll knock him off his horse. And a nice, open his eyes. But look, like all of us, we all experience that moment of hesitation, right? And look at this. Then Ananias answered, Lord, um, I've heard about, for many people, about this man. How much, he, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Like, are you sure you know what you're talking about, God? But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my sake. Notice he didn't say, I must show him how many great things. We, the church, we want to hear about how many great things God's going to do with us, but we don't want to hear how much you're going to suffer. Like, talk to me about all the great stuff. Don't talk to me about the suffering. Because what Christian wants to suffer, that shouldn't be the Christianity of 2018. That was for them. No, that's, this is for now. It's time for the church. We got we to embrace this, guys. We, get, we come to church too often, and we're just hearing the next best sermon, the next best this. But, but there's no change. The Holy Spirit lives in you. You just got to hook up with him. And so I got to show him what he must suffer for my namesake. And then look, Ananias went, to, went his way and he entered the house and laying his hands on him. He did what? Don't be that weird Christian that says, why aren't they laying hands on people? Read your Bible all through it. Jesus laid hands on people. The disciples laid hands on people. It's, it's, there's power. Where do you think the power is going to come from? It comes from the source, the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you think the source is going to get it out of you? Well, you got to go touch someone. So he lays hands on him and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received sight at once, and he arose, and he was baptized. So he got filled with the Holy Ghost, and he got water baptized. All right there, one package, man. It was a one-stop shop at Ananias' house. He got healed, he got filled, and he got wet. One-stop shop. And he got fed. Made some carnitas after that. And when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Look at this. And immediately. Everybody say, and immediately. But I don't know the word, Pastor. If the Holy Spirit can do it for Paul, why can't the Holy Spirit do it for us? It says, immediately he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of us are just waiting, well, if I just got to know enough Bible. Ver Let me tell you something. You got enough story of how God con converted your life. That is sufficient. And while you're still developing your, your Bible knowledge, while you're still developing your spiritual knowledge, while you're still growing in the local body of, called the church, you will begin to develop a language that's going to create a culture, that's going to create the kingdom, not only within you, but everywhere you go. It starts with you. I hate when people say, well, the reason I don't come here every week is because it's too far. <laughs> it's too far. It's too far. It's too far. If a drive is too far, your drive for Christ will be too far. It's too far. It's too, it takes too long. It takes me 45 minutes to get here. See, that's not full conversion. That's still living for you. You find the place called home, 
and you dive into the full immersion of the things of God. You don't, it's too far, it's too long, it's too much time, it's too much. Listen, earth is short, heaven is forever. We, we got to get to working. It's, it's to get rid of those words. The word of the Lord for 2019 for Elevate Church is, is something that's so, it's so needed right now. It's in Philippians 4.13. It's basically, I can, I will, the end. It's 2019. Tattoo it on you this week. Do something. Everybody say it with me. I can, I will, the end. Say it again. I can. I will. The end. I need you to go talk to that person. I need us to help children in Africa, in China, Japan, in whatever nation God puts children on our heart. I mean, how would you like your kids... To say, I can, I will, the end. Yes, mom. Yes, dad. Wouldn't that be amazing? Your 10 kids, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> yeah. When God's saying, go to the hospital. Pastor, can you go to the hospital? No, you go. What do you say? Yes, That's the word of the Lord for 2019. So obviously God's going to do something in greater depth at Elevate Church in 2019. I can. I will. The end. That means there's no room for excuses. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on the name of the Lord in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more. That would let them all talk. The more they talked, the more Paul increased. The more you grow in Jesus, the more people are going to talk, but the more you're going to grow in strength. And confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through uh, the wall in a large basket and when Saul had come to Jerusalem he tried to join the disciples notice it says he tried because <laughs> it sounded like heck no bro I know who you are but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple but so imagine all the challenges this brother was having but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road look at he's already testifying and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. But they attempted to kill him again. Look at that. Every time he preached the gospel, they try to kill him. Someone talks bad about us, we shrink back. Or it's too far. When the brethren found out, they brought him down uh, to uh, Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Then churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of who? And they were multiplying. They were growing. They were all growing. Let me give you a few points. Uh, Holy Spirit never tells us about himself. He was given to glorify Jesus through our life. Look at that. Number one, number one, he helps us to see Jesus more. Number two, to understand Jesus in depth. Listen, how many know that Jesus has height, depth, length, width, not only in love, but in his knowledge of him. Number three, to respond to Jesus more obediently. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Holy Spirit tells you, come on, let's go. Let's do it. No more excuses. We got this. We're doing it now. No more waiting tomorrow. I'll pray about it. Come on, man. You know you're being religious when you say, I'm praying. To, I'll pray about that, Pastor. You lie. You don't even pray. What you saying? Okay, I'm just playing. Number four, 
to be witnesses of our con uh, conversion with power, to be witnesses of our conversion with power. In other words, you don't just have a story, you have a powerful story. But I've never been a druggie. Guess what? You don't have to be a druggie, an ex-druggie, to have a powerful story. Man, my daughter, Alexis, where'd she go? Where's Alexis? Where you at? But way in the back over there. Uh, get, get up here already, guys. Worship team. You know, Alexis and Isaac, they say, well, we don't have a testimony like you. You were gangbanger and violent and, and drugged out and, 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 and beating people up and hurting people. And we don't got your kind of story, Dad. I'm like, you know what, guys? You got a better story than mine. You know what your story is? You never left him and you never forsook him. And he never left you and, and never forsook you either. How awesome is that that you can tell people, I've been walking with Jesus. Now she's 24 for 24 years walking not perfect but let me tell you something but passionately for jesus what a story is that that's powerful how do you do that in this society in this culture so don't say i don't got a story you all have a powerful story number five the holy spirit helps us to love jesus with a deeper heart of commitment but also boldness it's not just being a good church attender man it's about having commitment it's about having boldness for God listen we have an opportunity this is this is the moment we have the Holy Spirit you can share Christ to people at work tomorrow stop saying well it's because they'll fire me or they'll get in trouble well don't do it on the clock there's something called lunch hour and after work hours see how we're so filled with excuses like I can't preach Jesus at work you don't have to preach it just live it let the living do the talking. And then invite them to lunch. And then tell them, I'm a Christian. What? I knew you were, you were something special. And, and tell them, you know what? God has something special for you. And lay hands on them. And let the scales fall off them. Huh? Lay hands on them and let the scales fall. You know, I'm, I'm just going to, what are you doing? What are you doing? What, what are you doing? <laughs> Dude, uh, just relax. It's going to be good, man. And listen, listen. I promise you, try it. Just say just let me pray for you. Just, I know it may look weird because it is. It looks weird, but it's powerful. Let me just pray for you. And then watch. Listen, I promise you, when you pray with faith and courage and boldness, the Holy Spirit will meet you there, and heaven will come. And before you know it, they'll do this because I've done it many times in airports. I've done it in restaurants. I've done it in stores. I've done it in places where people will then open their eyes, and they're like this, like, wow, I'm dizzy. I'm like, you know what? that's God you just experienced heaven right now and they're just like wow you can do that if today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today